Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Feingold again, Tuesday evening. As you all know, we alternate between having a, okay. We alternate between having great players of the past at Endgame class. I forgot which one this is. So let's do the Endgame, right? Now, what was what last week's lecture about? Who remembers? Um, hmm. Oh, that's right. I was I told a lot of tall tales, right, Shivam? Maybe. Okay. Were you here last week? No, I wasn't. It, did you raise your hand? No. Because I made an announcement. Archer can back me up. If you're not here, raise your hand. No. You weren't here, so you should raise your hand. No, I mean last week you should have raised your hand. When you weren't here, now you are here. So what are you, what are you doing? Okay, so we're gonna do Rook and Pawn end games because Karen said so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now Rook and Pawn end games are the most common end games. Can, does anybody know why? Just a second. I'm making a large bet in Vegas. You guys don't know why. Okay, the bet was placed. Because you, I don't know. Hard to get the rooks activated. They stay in the back. Yeah, that's close enough. I, th I think I lost the bet. You! What was the question? So it wasn't in here. What? I already got it right. Oh. I, I, I said Rook and Pawn endgames are the most common endgames. Why? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Now, this lecture I actually stole from Delugi. That's why it says Rook and Pawn endgame maxims. You get it right. I... And, th and what? I do. And then they don't. You know, they might. No, they never heard of Maxim Delugi. They got nothing. Yeah. It's also pronounced Maxime, but... Don't tell them. Okay, so Rook and Pawn endings, I have some rules. I'm going to read the rules. Then I'm going to show you some games I played before you were born, especially you two. And then uh, I'm going to go over the maxims again. You want to activate your king. And basically, if I was giving you a one-hour chess lesson, a private lesson, and you were paying top dollar, I would say activate your king for an hour. And then you, you remember how you forget everything? For an hour, you might remember. You wouldn't, but you might. Okay, that's the biggest difference between stronger players and weaker players. Weaker players don't activate their king. The reason is, when the game starts, they know they shouldn't activate their king. You don't walk your king up the board unless you're watching your, my stream and it's me, then maybe. Okay, and so then as the game goes on, you actually have to change what you're doing. You can't just be like, this is how I play every move. And most people can't do that. So since they're not moving their king up the board the first 10 moves, they're not moving their king up the last 10 moves. That's a big mistake. If your king's not going to get checkmated, it's good to move it up and do stuff with it. Okay, and you'll see that in the games. Activate your rook. You can't have a passive rook. Your rook has to be on the 7th rank, the 8th rank, and if necessary, the ninth rank. Yeah, especially if you're playing in a German tournament. Okay, push your past pawns. Past pawns are good. That's a pawn that can't be stopped by another pawn. I recommend that. Okay, if you have past pawns, push them and make them queens. Now, in most end games, I'm going to say rook and pawn endings about 95% of the time or more. If you're not going to make a queen, you're not going to win. If we have a rook and pawn end game, and you have a rook and no pawns, and I have a rook and pawns, you're, you're not going to win. you got to make a queen. Otherwise, you just move our rooks around, doing nothing. So you have to get past pawns. You have to push them. The rook goes behind the past pawn, and the reason is when you're pushing your past pawn, you want your rook to be better, not worse. If your rook is in front of your past pawn, and your pawn starts pushing, your rook can't move. If your rook's behind your past pawn, and you push it, now your rook has more space, the other person's rook in front can't move, that's, that's better. Um, I made a spelling mistake with same, I almost spelled it right, bam, that's why pencils have erasers. Pawns on the same side with fewer pawns makes it closer to a draw, that's not a rook and pawn endgame rule, that's a rule for all endgames, but we're looking at rook and pawn endings. So when you want to win, if you have more pawns than your opponent, you would like pawns on both sides of the board, so your opponent's confused. If you're losing, or you're worse, and you're down pawns, you want pawns on one side of the board, and you want no pawns. 
If I randomly put a position up of rook and five pawns versus rook and four pawns, and there were pawns on both sides of the board, I would say it's usually a win. If I put rook and two versus rook and one on the same side of the board, I would say it's usually a draw. So the less pawns, and when they're on one side, that makes it a draw. So if you have a bad position, it would be good to trade all the pawns off. Then your opponent can't beat you because they have no pawns. And you want to cut off your opponent's king, which means your opponent's king wants to move up the board, but you don't let them. There's two ways to do that, vertically and horizontally, right? Yeah. So if your opponent's king wants to move sideways, you can cut their king off just like in king and rook versus king, if you've ever made it with a rook before. Now, you guys at home can't see these people, but 50-50. And um, you can also cut it off um, vertically, or wait, horizontally, I mean. And if your opponent wants to move up the board, you can make sure they can't by cutting their king off. If you have a passed pawn and you're trying to queen it, which is a good idea, unless you're playing me, then don't do that. I, I, I want to win. And your opponent's king is running towards the pawn, if you cut their king off so it can't move towards the pawn, like don't do that against me, but that's a good idea against most people. Now, it's funny, this is a total coincidence, and it's the theory of small numbers. I was looking at rook and pawn endings that I played in slow tournaments over the last 15 years, and I found ones I thought were good for the class, and it's a coincidence I was black in all of them, which I didn't know. So now I've had white and rook and pawn endings, but they weren't good for the class. So what would Wesley Snipes say? Always bet on black. Always bet on black. All right. I mean, in this class, anyway. Okay. So, oh, no, I wanted to look at... Actually, we'll look at this first. It doesn't matter. Okay. So this is my game from 2011, and this was when uh, Susan Polgar, who's looking at you right now over there, um, she runs the Spice Cup teams, and she was at Texas Tech, and now she's at... Weber? Close enough. Webster. Webster. Close enough. Okay. And this is when she was still in Texas. This is 2011. And I'm playing one of the people from the school. And he took my bishop because he knew I was going to lecture on rook and pawn endings nine years later. So he made sure that it wasn't rook and bishop versus rook. Then I can't lecture about the game. Okay. Now in this position... Black has some very big advantages. Some of them I talked about, some I didn't. White's pawn structure is very suspicious. Very suspicious. My pawns are together, right? And White's pawns are isolated and terrible. My king can move all around the board, and as I said in my preamble, okay, my rook is cutting off his king. His king can't move up the board. His king's trapped. Okay, and with those advantages, my rook's on the seventh rank, his rook's on the first rank, my king can move, his king can't move, and my pawn structure's better, that's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Now, not only do I not want my opponent's king to move, I don't want his rook to move. So I made a strange move here. Like, when I was looking at the position now, I haven't looked at it in nine years, I was thinking, well, this move makes sense, right? Or move my king over here. Okay, but I didn't do that. Now I was a better player nine years ago, so maybe my move was better during the game. I tried to make sure his rook couldn't move, so I played rook c3. That way if his rook moves, I'll take this pawn, and by the way, I'm going to take this pawn. Okay, now what's the most obvious move for white? Shivam, what's your name? Shivam. Correct. I wanted to ask a question he could get correct. Okay, now you can answer. King G2. King G2. Two, two in a row. Wow. Check his birth certificate. If it says something else, you're in trouble. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. So he, that was the most logical move. King F7 with obvious, you know, I'm going to go here. Pretty obvious. Rook E1. He's cutting my king off. He's using my own rules against me. Now, if white could move several times in a row, he would do that, and my king can't stop him. So 
Do I want my rook to go in front or behind? What was the rules? I forgot. Behind, right. Now, you might say, well, I want to do this, but I, I want this pawn. So I'll do this and I'll do this later. There might not be a later. Because after d6, rook d3, he could play rook e4 defending his pawn. And then maybe he'll play d7, d8. So if I let this pawn queen, it doesn't matter how weak his pawns are if they're queening. What kind of pawn is this? Pass. Pass pawn. Now, we're going to vote. It's our first vote of the class. See this pawn here? Yeah. Is that a passed pawn? No. Yes. 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 Did you vote yes and no? I like that. Okay, yes. It will. Be you, you abstain? It will be after. It will. He, he, we, we have yeah, one person voted yes and no. It will be one person said no, one said yes, and one abstention. It will be. After. It will be? Maybe, will maybe this pawn will, will be, but I don't want to know if it will be. Yes. Okay, I mean, Donald Trump will be out of office, but he's not yet. So, you know. This is in the future. You. No. You. Yes. In tough class. You. No. All right, now, I'm not saying there's a right answer, but we all have our own opinion, okay? My opinion, it is a passed pawn, because no opposing pawn can stop it. That's what I consider a passed pawn. Anyway, this pawn's definitely passed, and I don't want that pawn to queen, because then I can't show you this game. Because I wouldn't say I was white. Trick you, right? Okay, so I played rook d3, as discussed. Okay, now... He played rook b1. If he plays rook e4 with the idea of d6, d7, d8, how would I how would I get what, what would I do? You shiv him. F5. I play f5. If he plays rook f4, now my king's not cut off. And he doesn't have time to play d6, d7, d8, because he has too many moves. Okay, so we take each other's pawns. That's fair, right? Yeah, fair. But still. His pawns are all isolated and weak. In fact, yum, 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 yum. Now I'm a pawn ahead, and I have a passed pawn. Okay, he checks me, but I saw it. And I got that passed pawn. And he's being smart. He's trading pawns. When there's no pawns on the board, I can't win. Luckily, I have pawns on both sides of the board. If these pawns were gone, that, that would be a drawn position. I'd still win, but it would be a drawn position. Maybe I wouldn't win. 2,400. Okay, two against one on the same side, that's pretty drawn. But with pawns on both sides, probably winning. Especially since I'm, I'm going to go here and take it. There's a lot of ways to defend that. I wish I saw one. Okay, so he checks and attacks my pawn because he has to. If he doesn't, I'll play rook d3 and take his pawn. Now the problem with what he did is he's letting my king out. And I defend and my king can move up. Go my king. Hooray for my king. Okay. And I played g4. And I still have a king. Now normally... If these pawns are gone, this is a very easy draw, but white needs to use his rook to do stuff against my king. If white uses his rook to do stuff against my king, I'll, I'll go take this pawn. So he's got to, like, keep an eye over here and keep an eye over here. Can't do it. I got, I got two ways to win. I could win his A pawn or I could queen my F pawn. He can't do both. He can't move his king over here. First of all, it's illegal. But if he did, my pawn's queening. So he's got to keep his king here, which means I could win by queening, or I could win by going over here. And when there's on both sides of the board, there's, there's nothing he can do. He can't, go, can't be on both sides of the board. So that's why you want pawns on both sides of the board. It gives the defense too much to do. Now I'm threatening mate. I'm the best. Like that checkmate there? You guys see it? All right. Yes. 
That's a very common checkmate in yeah. end games. Yeah, he hates getting checkmated. All right, so now he's got nothing, and he's got plenty of it. I am teasing him pretty good. Okay, hooray! Now, when my opponent let me do that, I was very suspicious. This is the difference between me and you. Your opponents are lower rated than my opponents. Yeah, that's the ticket. For example, Karen and I are going to Foxwoods in April. My opponents will be higher rated than her opponents. Because she's playing the under 1800 section, and I'm not. So her opponents will be in the 1600s for the most part, and my opponents will be in the 2300s for the most part. Now, when you're me, and everybody you play is 23, 24, 25, 2600, and they let you win, you're confused. When your opponents let you win, you're like, well, yeah, I'm, look who I'm playing. So if I'm playing somebody rated 1,000, I'm like, yeah, they let me queen. But this guy's rated over 2,400, so I'm like, why is he letting me queen? What's happening here? And obviously, since my opponent's pawn can't move, and his king can barely move, he's playing for stalemate. Okay, They're always playing for stalemate when you're beating them. And so he played here, check, and then he played here. And most of you would make a queen without thinking. And that does win. If I make a queen, what move does he make? Takes it. No, that, that's, that's not playing for stalemate. That's just losing. Rook takes six. Rook, rook here? Yeah, one of What? So if I make a queen... You need to chase the king around. Yeah, he can check me, and I can never take his rook. That's, that's the stalemate trick I was referring to. It doesn't work, because I can block with my queen by tricks. But, Archer, you have, a, you have an idea? Yeah. Like, block with your queen with tricks? Yeah, I could go here. If he checks me with a rook, I, I take it. No stalemate. And if he checks me here, this wins. There's no stalemate, and I'll promote my pawn. Okay, so I'm still winning. But I wanted to know that I knew, that he knew, that I knew, that he knew was stalemate. So I promoted to a rook. Now there is no stalemate because the king can go here. So he resigned at that point. But when you're winning and you're finally winning an endgame, there's a lot of stalemates. Because you're winning, so that means your opponent has almost nothing left. So I play people who try to get stalemated a lot. And then fool me twice, shame on, you know, one of you guys. All right. So I win. Hooray for Ben. Okay. Uh, this game was played in 2012, a year later in Chicago. Now this looks like a draw because both sides have four pawns. Nobody's king is really better. And I have isolated pawns. My opponent has an isolated pawn. All right, so what's the difference? The difference is one of the things that was in that list. Here's the list if you forgot. I have something my opponent does not. Archer. An active rook. My rook is more active than my opponent's. That's correct. My rook's on the eighth rank. My opponent's rook's on the second rank. And my opponent can't activate their rook. They can't. Yeah. But something you have a past pawn. I have a past pawn. Okay, my opponent does not. Okay, so I have an active rook and I have a past pawn. I'm not saying I'm winning, but I take black easy. I have a past pawn, I have an active rook. My pawn's a passive rook and not past pawn. Easy. Now, unfortunately for you, you're not old like me, right, Karen? Karen's actually not as old as me, which confuses her. Because she's been playing chess for a few years. I've been playing chess... I can't, I can't count that high. It was about 45 years. Okay, Because I've been playing chess so long, I've had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of endgames. If your rating is low, like in this classroom, and you're playing other people whose ratings are low, sometimes one of you might blunder. 
And when you get to the end game, one of you is up three pieces. Those end games aren't as interesting. When you're lower rated, which I used to be, I didn't have a lot of end games like this. My end games were somebody was up a queen. Because, you know, I was rated a thousand, my opponent's rated a thousand. So we're hanging all our pieces. When you're really high rated and your opponent's really high rated, you get these endings where you're like, I don't know, somebody's better, I guess. And then you get a lot of experience playing them. My opponent's a lot younger than me and lower rated than me, so she doesn't have the experience in end games. She might open, she might memorize opening variations better than me. She might calculate better than me, but when it's a boring end game, that's my specialty. I'm an old man. I was born an old man, right? Some people call me Benjamin. What? Button, right? Very good. Yeah. Okay. So I played Rook C1. My opponent played the obvious move. B3. B3. And I played A5. I have an isolated pawn, but for how long? Like one more move. And I want to play this move because I want to take this and then win it, or I want to go here and then queen it. Or my opponent can take, and I can take all their pawns. This is actually a very advanced minority attack. I have two pawns against three, but I'm the one attacking. Rook d3, defense. Attacking the pawn. And my opponent blocks it up, but that ruins her pawn majority. Three pawns to two, try to get a passed pawn. I don't think so. Instead, white's playing defensively. White says, I defend this, I defend this, this defends this. Draw. How can I lose? You can't take anything. Well, I can win because I have a passed pawn, and you'll never have a passed pawn. And White's making a fatal mistake, which you should never make in an endgame. Let's go back to my thing here. Activate your rook. Activate your king. And my opponent is thinking, I'll just defend everything and draw. No, that's not how you play rook endings. You don't say back and say, I hope I can draw. That's how you lose. It's the old, old adage, which you've all heard before. Playing for a draw is playing for a loss. Okay, so we play rook b2, and we tie down the rook. This rook has to stay on this pawn forever. So that, that rook's not very active. My rook has a lot of scope. Okay. When it plays g4, trying to trade pawns. Giving me a passed pawn, though. Still have a passed pawn. And now, my opponent played g5. A very bad move. And g5, to me, is like giving up. My opponent's like, well, I guess I'm going to lose because I can't move anything. So let me give you an example of not moving anything. Let's trade pawns. Obviously, this walks into a fork. That's probably not a good move. Right? Okay, well, suggest a move. Um, There's three moves that make sense. Rook d3, rook c3, king g3. Otherwise, I'm taking this pawn with check. If you play rook d3, I fork. If you play rook c3, you're in Wang Chung. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. If that's not Suk Swang, then what is? Confusing the audience. White can't do anything, okay? And if, he, if my opponent plays king g3, again, can't move anything. Easy win. Okay, so my opponent said, well, I can't do that, so let's play g5 check. Now we're going to vote. Because voting's fun, okay? Now... I don't really know how to run the vote, so I'm looking to some professionals, okay? So based on the professionals from last night, I'll tell you the results of our voting in like six months. Nothing? No. All right. These, these guys haven't heard of Iowa. All right. So, I mean, I can move my king lots of places. Look at all those options, right? Look at that. Even way over here, because I'm a grandmaster. Okay. So let's raise your hand and suggest a move. You. F4. F4 and your king's in check. 
Oh, Very suspicious. Right. King F4. All right. <laughs> you with a legal move. King takes G5. King takes G5. What about you? You yeah, agree? That was my move. You agree? All right. Now, who wants to trade pawns, me or my opponent? My opponent. Yeah, so this trades pawns. If I take and my opponent takes, I take, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good looking rook, right? That rook's looking good. That's a very active rook, and it's going to be like two pawns versus one. So that's probably a draw. Okay. Now, I want to have lots of passed pawns. So what move did I make? King Giving me the most passed pawns. King e6. King e6. Now I got two passed pawns, one for each of you. Right? Is Tombstone your favorite movie? You know why it's not? Because you haven't heard of it. Now you've heard of it. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about over here? No? Nothing? Yeah. All right. Now, my opponent also has a passed pawn. Ooh, I'm scared. No, not really. Okay, so G6. Let's get it going. Right? And then if I go take that pawn and lose my E pawn, it was all for naught. Frankly, ridiculous. So I play the obvious move. E4 check. E4 check. I, got, I got two passed pawns. This sheet says push your passed pawns. Remember? I got two of them. I can't believe I had two of them. E4. King F4. King G3 makes more sense, I guess. Because after King F4, what obvious move do I have? Um... Rook G2. Yeah, rook G2, and I just take that pawn, right? That pawn can't be defended. So, yeah, I think king G3 makes more sense. Now, if I go here, I, I guess I just win the pawn. Yeah, it's just, that pawn's not dangerous. Yeah. Okay, rook G2 takes. Now, my opponent has an active rook, but I have two passed pawns. Time to get more passed pawns. And then king e5 is very important. I'm pretty sure any move wins, but I don't care about that pawn. That pawn's not dangerous at all. I care about those pawns. Do I want to lose those pawns? No. no. If I go here, my opponent can check me and probably win my f pawn. Okay, so I go here moving my king up the board, like there. Now we're talking. Yeah. These pawns can never be captured. Yeah. And here my opponent resigned. Because that's, man, that pawn especially. That's going to be a good pawn. So I actually won that endgame easily. And the reason was my opponent played very passively. A4, rook d3, and just sat there like this. That, that didn't work. And when you have a 3-2 to two majority and you're trying to create a passed pawn, that's, that's not the pawn structure to do it. A4. Ugh. Okay. My opponent was more concerned with losing a pawn than making a passed pawn. And because of that, they had no counterplay. Terrible. Good for me, though. Okay. I showed that person who the older person was. Okay. Now, this I have a funny story about. Uh, Eric Hansen, who you all know. Yes. What? Yeah, there you go. He's one of the chess bras. Okay. And Eric Hansen is much higher rated than me. However... He wasn't always much higher rated than me because I'm older than him, right? So in 2010, I was higher rated than him. It's not 2010 anymore. And uh, this was a round robin where everybody plays everybody. And I think this was the first game I won. Okay, I took. Now, <clears throat> this actually reminds me of the last game. I got two passed pawns. My opponent has one passed pawn. I'm not really scared of that pawn. That's... that's so I, I thought this was a very easy win, so I moved as fast as I could. Good idea, except for one thing. Not a good idea. Okay, my opponent thought he was lost, so he was moving fast too. It was a real good game. Okay, and he is lost, and then we both just blundered. Okay, so I was like, man, this is an easy win. I got two passed pawns. Look at me. I'm the best. Look at all those passed pawns I got. Bam. And my opponent played c7. Now in this position, 
it turns out that F3 was a mistake. Who could have thunk it? And according to the engine, this is the only winning move. Rook here check. Okay. And after F3, which is a, not a good move, now the game should be a draw. Um, I just thought everything won easily. I, you know. uh, and the reason it's a draw is my opponent can just play Rook F8. And I was thinking, well, I'll go here, and I got two pawns, and he's got one pawn, so I'll win. But it's, it's, it's not true. That, this pawn's really strong. That pawn's almost queening. This pawn can't move. And the problem is, which I didn't realize during the game, if I escort my pawn home, well, if I ever play king e3, let's, let's make a move and we'll play king e3. I mean, my pawn can just go here. I had two passed pawns. Soon I won't. And then this is like, I mean, this is like the same position. Like, what's, 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 why am I better here? This is just this is just draw. Yeah. So that was a blunder on my part when I played f3. Never play f3. My opponent was also moving quickly and played c7. Whew. The losing move. Hooray for me. And I played this move because if my opponent queens, I can check and take that queen, and I'm going to queen. Yeah. Hooray for Ben. Go Ben. And here's the other issue my opponent has. After Rook F8, if I take this pawn, which I can easily do, and my opponent takes this pawn, that's a draw. As we discussed, pawns on the same side, fewer pawns makes it a draw. That would be Rook and one pawn versus rook and zero pawns. So if I go here and trade, that, that's just a draw. I can't win this. So what move did my opponent well? So what move did I play instead of this blunder winning the game? The answer is very funny. Unless you have the white pieces, then the answer is not funny. Black to play and win. You Always play F1. Yeah. Right. F1, check. Obviously they take. Well, he resigned. But Takes, takes. Oh, and if you promote, I check and win your queen. Aw. Do you feel bad for him? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and when the game ended, I thought, I'm the greatest player ever. Then I looked at it with an engine. I was like, oh, every move double question mark. Because I'm playing instantly. Because I thought it was an easy win. When you have a rook and pawn end game or a king and pawn ending, it's not easy. And a lot of people who are not me, and also me, play too quickly in the end game because they think it's easy. And that throws everything away. Very famous game between Bobby Fischer and Max Irva in my 60 memorable games, probably here at the Chess Center, with a rook and pawn ending where Fischer just moved instantly and he won. And some grandmaster is like, what are you doing? Why are you playing so fast? He's like, easy win. Then the guy analyzed it with him. So some guy, you know, grandmaster, and like, had no trouble drawing because Fisher made a terrible move. But Fisher thought, that's easy. Just play fast and win. Okay. I did play fast and win. Then when I analyzed, I was like, Ugh. So when you have a bad position, your opponent's playing fast, they could be messing up. So after the game, I thought I played great. I played the correct plan, I thought. F3, F2, F1. Good plan. But after F3, my opponent blundered. Rick F8's a draw, and he played C7. So I was winning again. But yeah, I, man, if I had drawn that game, it would be pretty silly. Because I had a five-hour game, and I messed up the last five minutes. And somehow after that game, he became... By the way, he wasn't even a Grandmaster then. Now... Before I show you the last game, I want to tell you the end of this story with this Eric Hansen, right? I have a friend, which already is a funny story, right? And his name is Will Ree. He comes here once a year for the Fine Gold Memorial. He's been here twice because we've had two of them. He's 2,000 on a good day. Sometimes it's not a good day. Anyway, yes? I think he comes for the birthday bash. Uh, what? It's 
Oh, you thing. mean the chess center? Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's also possible. Anyway, uh, he was talking to Eric Hansen in St. Louis because Will Reese sometimes goes to St. Louis and, you know, it's the Singfield Cup or the U.S. Championship and he wants to watch. And he saw Eric Hansen there. I was probably doing commentary with Eric. And Will said, Eric Hansen, I played your brother in the National Open, you know, 1,000 years ago. He was rated about 1,600. And Eric Hansen said, that was me. Just because he's a grandmaster now doesn't mean he was a grandmaster 20 years ago. He was 1,600. Now he's a grandmaster, right? And a lot of grandmasters that you know, if you play them when they're little kids, they, you, you can beat them. Now you can't beat them. but Now, now they're grandmasters when they're little kids. But that's different. So it was him. And Will Reed lost, even though he was higher rated than Eric Hansen. Okay, last but not least... This is one of my funniest games ever because this was a round robin where everybody plays everybody. And the round times are set in advance. And this was two rounds a day. The time control was game 90, increment 30. In theory, the game could go forever because we get 30 seconds a move. But in practice, how long is the game going to go? Well, this game went past the round time. So the other games started, and our games didn't. Then when the game ended, the guy said, okay, you get 20 minutes to eat. Then we went and ate together somewhere, me and my opponent. This game was 93 moves, and we were getting 30 seconds a move. So this is the game that does uh, in end. All right, I played king here because it's legal, and he took the pawn. Now, black has several advantages. The main advantage is black's up a pawn. White's advantage is there's almost no pawns on the board. When there's no pawns on the board, you can't win. My other advantage is there's pawns on both sides. Okay? And my other advantage, and if we look here, okay, uh, passed pawn, I have a passed pawn, he doesn't. Pawns on the same side, I have pawns on both sides. And number four, rook goes behind passed pawn. Right? It says so. So what move do you think Black made here? You. Rook A7. Right, I'm not sure if I played Rook A7, but it sounds good, right? Yeah. I'm going to check him first. I, I did check him first. That way Black's king has some more space. Okay, then I played Rook A7. I have an interesting plan. It's a good plan, right? Yeah, I like that plan. Okay, let's do that plan. Yeah. All right, then I move my king up. So my Rook is better than his Rook. Because my rook can move, and his rook can't move. My rook has these three squares, and if his rook moves, I push my pawn. So probably shouldn't move that rook. If you go take my pawn, how's that king and pawn ending looking for white? Not good. There's good, and there's not good. That's not good. So he can never take my pawn. He can never move his rook. The truth hurts. But it's very hard for black to win, because he's cutting off my king. I can't get in there. It's not fair. So he can't do anything, but I can't do anything. Luckily, it's his move. Okay, so he moved his king, obviously. And I'm like, well, you got to move something. So he moved his rook, and I'm like, all right, I tried, and I failed miserably. Finally, I gave up my pawn to win this pawn. And then I got that pawn. And his king, is it in front of my pawn? No. no. Okay, now, most of you would take this pawn immediately, and then black wins in one move. You. Oh, snap. So you can't take that pawn. Okay, he played king e3, and I defended my pawn. And now I move my king to the other side of the board. Ha-ha! That's where my passed pawn is. And my rook defends my other pawn. Yes. That's why it's good to have pawns on both sides of the board. You can win either way. Now that reminds me of a funnier story. I never pass up a chance to make fun of Shanklin. Never. That's actually one of the rules on that you didn't, it was in small print. You didn't see that one. Okay, I was playing Shankland in the US Championship before you guys were born in your favorite city, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Is that your favorite city? All right. And I had a queen, 
and he had a rook and a bishop. And I, we had pawns on both sides of the board, so my king went that way, and then that way, and then that way, and then that way, and eventually I broke through and I won. Sometimes you got to keep trying. Okay, here I've already tried enough. My my king here is fine. Yeah. Oh, he tried to get his king in, but I wouldn't let him. Man, that's a pretty good looking pawn. Look at this trick he's playing for. Tricks are for kids. Should I make a queen? Make a knight might not win. Probably wins. But if I lose that, that pawn on h4, I won't win. These guys are always playing for tricks. I'm like ready to queen my pawn, and he's like, no, you can't queen it. Notice if I queen, he checks and takes my queen. Uh, rook b1. Rook b1, he checks and takes my pawn. That's true. Man, chess is hard. What about... Uh, oh, no. It's done. How about rook b5? Rook here? Yeah. Yeah, that should win. Mm -hmm. This should win, this should win, and this should win like in my head. Since this game was played in 2005, it's, it'd be a surprise to me too. Um, I like this move because it's funny. That way if his rook ever takes my pawn, I check and take his rook. So I sort of like that. Hey, what do you know? I liked the same stuff I liked 15 years ago. I think this is the move you suggested. Mm -hmm. This looks good. Here, here. Well, that's probably inaccurate. Takes, takes, here. This looks good for black. Mm -hmm. Black has a good plan. Yeah. Bam. That looks good for black. Also, king b5 looks good. Okay, so I played rook g4. Played here. Takes. Uh-oh. It's going to be stalemate again. They're always playing for stalemate. They're always doing it. So I checked him. Now there won't be any stalemate. You see the stalemate? He can just start checking me forever. I can't take his rook. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. He's always playing for stalemate. Oh, snap. I like that check, check, and then push the pawn. Notice how I cut his king off. I checked him. Then I checked him again, and now I push the pawn because his king's cut off. So now I have a very simple plan. H2, rook g1, check, queen. He actually didn't resign. He made me do this? Wow. He resigned after I queened? Man. It's playing on a long time. That's called a bitter ender. Yeah. Now, unlike about half of you in the room, I know how to mate with a rook. So he resigned. Right? Man, they don't say nothing. They're all like, I know how to mate with a rook. Yeah, we know how to do that. What? All of you? All of us. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Are you innocent? Okay. Do you agree? Is he innocent, Shepard? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. A good maybe, yeah. Now, let's go back to what I was talking about. Activate your king. My king goes that way, that way. Always move my king up. Activate my rook, obviously. I pushed my past pawns. I pushed all my past pawns, and I, and I, que I was queening all of them. Yes, sorry for me. Rook goes behind the past pawn. We just saw that. Pawns on opposite sides, you win. Pawns on one side, usually you don't win. And cut off the opponent's king so their king can't move. Now, all this stuff you're trying to do when you play the end game. In theory, your opponent's trying to do it also. So your opponent's move shouldn't surprise you. You should think about what good moves they're going to make. It's the same good moves you're going to make. In theory, in practice, it might be different. So that was the rook and pawn endings. If you memorize all those end games, then you might beat me. So don't, you know, don't memorize them too much, right? But the most important of all those rules is activate your king. Lower rated players... I'm watching them play end games and their king never moves. You gotta, you gotta move your king. What would Steinitz say? Also, who is Steinitz? Exactly. I know who Steinitz. Who was he? Um, he was a chess player. He was a chess player. There you go. Yeah, he got it right. I got a question. I have an answer. What if you have two rooks? You want to keep your king in? Or That's a different lecture. Uh, in general, in end games, move your king up. One rook, two rooks. 
True Rux is slightly more dangerous. Slightly. Okay, now her sister, who's her high rated sister? What's her name? Judith. Judith, yeah. I played her before you were born in Belgium in a game 15 tournament. We got to a double rook end game. She moved her king up and I checkmated her. So if you're playing me, walk your king up to checkmate. If you're playing other people, walk your king up and take all the pawns. Yeah. No, generally move your king up, but obviously with true rooks it's more dangerous. On the other hand, if your king's taking all the pawns, and also good. Yeah. All right, thanks for watching my rook and pawn in game lecture. This guy over here, he wants a double rook in game lecture. Those are tougher. Two rooks. Twice as hard that lecture. Yeah. All right, don't forget to like and subscribe and go to all the YouTube channels and buy merch. Buy merch or else. This is Grandmaster Feingold. Bye.